Please welcome to the stage Dr. Kirk Parsley. I feel like a rock star with all these lights, man. Uh, unfortunately, I can't play instruments or anything. All right. Oh, this up. Good. Um, so I'm assuming you guys uh, are interested in sleep and willpower if you're here. Uh, you came to this lecture on purpose. Um, Perhaps some of you know who I am, perhaps some of you don't, so I do a, a little ego uh, a little ego slide here. Um, the top, uh, the subject of this is sleep and willpower, as you, as you probably know, or I think I called it sleep and the key, sleep, the key to willpower, is that right? Um, so, I was, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to cover this slide primarily uh, to give a, a preface as to why I ended up doing a sleep uh, or willpower lecture at this event, um, and why I'm at this event to begin with. Uh, besides, uh, Rob Wolf obviously always always conning me into doing these events. Um, so I uh, I actually, if anyone was anyone on the stress panel yesterday where I was talking, so. You may, have, you may have heard me allude to the fact that I had a pretty crappy uh, childhood, um, and I, I, I don't want to blow it out of proportion. There's probably people here with, with worse uh, childhoods than mine. Um, but I was uh, a very sort of angry, uh, stressed out kid, and I uh, was a terrible student, uh, ended up dropping out of high school. Um, and join, uh, going to be a SEAL because I thought that would be an appropriate place to express, express my anger without getting in trouble. Um, and in fact, it would be encouraged. And so I said, that's a perfect fit. Um, so I did that. I went through uh, SEAL training. Um, and at some point uh, during my uh, SEAL career, and it, it, was, uh, it was pretty short, and we didn't have the same type of combat that SEALs have now, uh, which is, of course, why most SEALs become SEALs. Uh, so it got a little monotonous, but also just the physiologic stress of the job uh, kind of ages you a little quickly. Um, and I uh, realized that it was a young single man's job, and I felt I was quickly becoming neither. Uh, so I said, well, I'm going to move on and do other things. And I left the military planning to be a physical therapist, ended up obviously becoming a doctor, uh, uh, being completely sure that I would go directly back to the SEAL teams, um, which we'll talk about in a second, didn't uh, immediately happen. Um, I went to the military's medical school uh, in Bethesda. I actually didn't even know they had their own, military, uh, their own medical school until like two weeks before I applied. And I was like, well, that sounds like a great deal. They're going to pay me to go to medical school. Um, and um, then for reasons I will only discuss over NorCal Margaritas, which you have to buy, uh, I did an internship in obstetrics and gynecology. Um, <laughs> and I remember very vividly uh, during my third year of medical school, during my OB rotation, telling my classmates, if I had to do this as a doctor, I wouldn't be a doctor. I would do anything else. I'd go fix Harleys or something. Um, and then ironically, that's where I ended up. Um, after that, I left and did uh, a residency that's exclusive to the military in what's called undersea and hyperbaric medicine uh, with, the, you know, with the design, of course, of being able to treat divers uh, and the specific physiological changes that go on with dive medicine uh, in, in high pressure environments and so on and so forth. And then said, of course, they're going to send me right back to the SEAL teams. And they didn't. Uh, they felt I was much more suited for submarine rescue, which is what the DSU uh, thing is there. So I went and did submarine rescue for a couple of years. Um, turned out great because I traveled a lot. And I went to Australia and I met my wife, who's back here, a beautiful woman. So good good for that to happen. And then I went to uh, back to that NSWG1, Naval Special Warfare Group 1, and I actually went back to be a doctor about uh, 20 yards away from where my locker had been when I was a SEAL. Um, lots of my friends were still SEALs, they're still active duty, um, and I got there at a great time, very fortuitous. Uh, there were, if any of you have been in the military or big bureaucratic organizations, 
Um, you probably know how slow uh, initiatives move. Uh, so there had been this initiative for about 10 years um, to start treating the SEALs more like professional athletes or something along those lines, to actually take care of the guys and not just assume they're hard as nails and they'll just do whatever we tell them to do and they'll never break, or if they break, we'll just replace them. Um, and so I got there at a very fortuitous time when this initiative was actually being implemented. I got to be an instrumental part of building the first sports medicine facility the SEALs had ever had. Um, and was integral in hiring our very first exercise physiologist and our very first uh, sports, our very first nutritionist, uh, our very first strength and conditioning coach. Um, and uh, we even brought in a psychologist, a sports psychologist, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and, that, and keep in mind, I, I didn't invent this. I'm not saying I, like, I developed all this for the SEALs. I, I was there at the right time to be a part of this. Um, and then I you know, brought in orthopedic surgeons and athletic trainers and physical therapists. And so now I was the dumbest guy in sports medicine at that point because I'd hired all the people who were brilliant. Uh, we brought from professional sports teams and so forth. Um, and so, again, if you've been in a bureaucratic organization, what happens when you're the least qualified guy? They put you in charge, right? So then I was in charge of managing it. So now I'm in charge of all these guys who know more than I do. Um, and so fortunately, what the SEALs wanted to come talk to me about um, was problems that they weren't willing to share with their physicians, with other physicians before me or other healthcare practitioners. Uh, because a lot like the aviation field or other um, sort of high risk jobs, um, if you admit to some sort of um, you know, psychological problems, uh, something that sounds like depression or you know, anxiety disorders or something, you'll, you'll get disqualified, uh, at least for a time, and these guys don't want it. So they would, they would come and close the door and, and tell me the real truth uh, that they hadn't told a lot of other people. Um, and so that, that's all part of like my normal story uh, um, when I get into sleep physiology. I, I, um, there's no possible way for me to come uh, to, to give you more than 5% of, of the relevant information uh, in, in a 50 minute lecture or, or uh, whatever this is. Um, but uh, the reason I bring all of this up, um, you know, part of this resiliency program was we did, uh, we did events with the SEALs to encourage resiliency. And there were events similar to this, actually. Um, and, we, and we brought in nutritionists to speak, and we brought in psychiatrists and, or psychologists to speak, and family counselors, and all sorts of. Um, experts to kind of take the pressure off of the SEALs so that they could focus on being SEALs and help balance their lives uh, and help balance uh, the effects of combat and um, excessive fatigue and excessive travel and all that other stuff. Um, and I met Rob Wolf doing a few of these gigs and um, we, you know, it just seemed like we all talked about the same things. If you heard our lunchtime chat, same, you know, the same story there. Um, but the reason I put this slide up in this lecture is I, want to, I wanted to point out that, and, and this, this isn't accurate anymore. I've, I've been meaning to change this uh, for two years. Um, right around here, I started learning about sleep. Uh, this is insignificant. That was a concierge practice I was a part of. Um, so I did learn something about sleep, but only about here, and it was all self-education, and it was something that I felt uh, was probably at the core of a lot of the problems that the SEALs were having. So the problems that they were uh, confiding in me were that um, their motivation wasn't quite where it should be. Uh, they felt like uh, they were more anxious. They felt like they had a harder time paying attention. Um, they were eating really well. They were, um, they were worshiping Rob Wolf's podcast and doing everything that he said to the T. And they were, you know, doing exactly the right exercises that all of our trainers were having them do. Um, but they were saying, you know, something's off. I don't feel like me. And, and, and I don't mean just to say that they were un, or incapable of doing their job. They're phenomenally capable guys. And so at their worst, they're still pretty damn good. Um, but they didn't feel good. They didn't feel like they were at their best and they wanted to know why and what they could do about it. And I had absolutely no idea. Uh, and so that's what led me to start researching sleep uh, because what I found is that about 75% of them were taking Ambien on a nightly basis. Um, 
and if any of you are, are uh, SF guys or former SF guys who know any of those guys, uh, you know the mentality that if one is good and two's probably better and three's got to be great and four is probably the best, then chase that with a little bit of alcohol and you got a great sleep cocktail. Um, and then they'd wake up at like three o'clock in the morning, couldn't go back to sleep, and so they'd say, well, I'm going to go to the gym and work out really hard and then I'll be really tired tonight and then I'll get good sleep. Um, and I'd say, well, how long have you been trying that? And they'd say, you know, five years. And I'd go, today's probably the day it's going to work, so keep that up. It's, um, and uh, in, in learning about sleep, I slowly started seeing, uh, we didn't have big sleep problems when I was a SEAL. Um, and so apart from the combat, which is an, an obvious major factor, uh, apart from the extreme combat that these guys have been in, their operational tempo, um, w you know, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between these guys and SEALs from my genre. So I was like, well, you know, what's different? Um, what, what is it that's so different about the lifestyle? We still traveled a ton. We still trained a ton. You know, we still trained very stupidly and ate very poorly. and. Um, so I, I really started investigating the sleep and that led me to learning about sleep physiology and what goes on to ordinarily allow yourself to go to sleep. And I figured out, well, you know, guys are vitamin D3 deficient uh, and I tested all that and I gave them that supplement and I was like, yeah, fixed it, man, that's good. And I kind of fixed it, you know, like some people, ah, a little better. And then I found out, well, you actually, you need magnesium for vitamin D3 to work. So, okay, well, let's add that. Um, and, you know, slowly just started doing that and working on a lot of sleep hygiene and behavioral uh, therapy around sleep. Um, again, the reason I bring all of this up is to point out that none of this, uh, either any of my education, any of my rigorous training, any of my life uh, struggles or any of, you know, this, um, you know, self-directed intense learning, uh, focused learning, had anything to do with willpower, okay? That willpower did not drive me to do any of this. And, and that's, that's the postulate of my um, lecture and, and hopefully you'll agree with me at the end. Uh, if you don't, you're probably wrong. Um, so, much like medicine, um, I mean, everybody here knows what functional medicine is, I'm assuming, hands, like I, uh, all right, most people, and integrative medicine, alternative medicine. Uh, can anybody explain the difference to me? <laughs> it's a mess, right? But the whole idea is that we, in the Western model of medicine, we broke the body, we broke the body down into these artificial systems, right? We said, well, this is the nervous system, and this is the digestive system, and this is the cardiorespiratory system, and this is the musculoskeletal system. And as we talk about in all these lectures, which keeps a you know, recurring theme, is that there are no such things as systems, <laughs> right? You can, you can delineate them out, but that's purely our cognitive design of deliver uh, uh, delineating them out. Um, the body functions as a whole, and everything affects everything, right? And so now we have integrative medicine because we disintegrated medicine, right? We disintegrated the body and now we have to reintegrate it so that we can actually understand it because it turns out that giving somebody f something for their nerve pain impacts their ability to sleep and then that impacts their insulin sensitivity and that impacts their cravings and that impacts their nutrition and that impacts their energy and that impacts their exercise and multitude of examples. So I'd like to compare that to sort of the paradigm of what we're going through now. And I think that most people have seen something like this, right? The four, the four pillars of health. Is, is this novel? People have seen it before? One, one, only one person has seen this before? Okay. So I submit that we're, we're falling into the same trap, okay? Um, not to the same degree, because we are trying to integrate uh, all of it in efforts like this. Um, but a lot of the times we like to talk about, well, it's nutrition or it's sleep or it's your stress or spirituality or mindfulness or whatever you want to call that pillar. Um, and again, I, I propose that all of those things are completely intertwined. And 
my reason or you know a, an example of my reasoning for that is we're going to talk about willpower today um, so if we agree that these are the four pillars of health or you know some approximation thereof where does willpower fit all of them right like willpower is, is affected by all of them um, and willpower affects all of them right so what I'd like to what I'd like to do is is uh, flesh out the sleep component of that. Uh, I believe uh, Dave Ashbury talked earlier today about some nutritional components of that. Uh, I didn't get to hear it, so I don't know exactly what he said. Um, and I, I know every every lecturer is kind of talking about cognitive functioning uh, within these pillars. Um, so. I always like to start any topic like this uh, by making everybody feel inferior. Um, so, can somebody tell me what willpower is? Somebody's got to know. Somebody. Give me a guess. Overriding an impulse with a decision. You cheated. Uh, okay, pretty good. I'm not going to repeat it because she took my thunder. Um, <laughs> Kelly McGonigal, you guys familiar with Kelly McGonigal? Great TED Talk, wrote the book The Will Willpower Instinct. Uh, she is a psychologist researcher at Stanford. Um, and she divided willpower up into I will, I won't, and I want. Um, because obviously willpower isn't always willing yourself to do something, sometimes it's willing yourself not to do something, and sometimes willpower is simply delaying gratification so that you can get what you really want. That's the idea of this. But the reason I put this slide up isn't to delineate the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere and the ventral aspect of the prefrontal cortex, but this prefrontal cortex is really important, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, but I wanted to point out that the prefrontal cortex is willpower. Okay, what we think of as willpower. And it's a finite energy sourced organ, just like anything else in our body. And we'll talk about what it does and what it doesn't do, and why you shouldn't rely on willpower to change behavior. All right? So, Kelly McGonigal's definition of willpower is the ability to do what you really want to do when part of you doesn't really want to do it. Um, and she's much cuter than I am and bubbly, and so it sounds f cooler when she says it. So I, I, liked it. I liked the definition. Um, but to me, it's, it's uh, a little circuitous and a little, uh, a little nebulous is exactly what that means. Uh, Robert Sapolsky, people familiar with him, uh, zebras don't get cancer. Another Stanford researcher, uh, one of the front runners in cortisol and stress research, he defines it as the ability to do the harder thing which I agree with in portion, um, but uh, in my opinion, there's a presupposition in this that the harder thing is the right thing. Uh, sometimes, the right th something, sometimes the wrong thing is the harder thing, so um, willpower wouldn't really apply in that situation. So uh, probably the correct answer uh, is this one. Um, it's a physiological state uh, that allows the conscious brain to observe and override the, our innate desires, which is basically uh, what she said in fewer words, uh, because she cheated somehow. Um, and this is the operational definition that I'm going to use throughout this lecture. Um, and I think you can see that this definition does not exclude these. The, dif the difference is that I am making a difference, uh, I'm separating out um, uh, goal-directed behavior as uh, some sort of mentally derived exercise versus a physiological phenomenon. So again, the prefrontal cortex, um, it gives us our executive functioning. People, and you guys have probably heard that term, I assume, right? And it, it's basically the rubric of um, you know, working memory, ability to make decisions, um, your ability to use your working memory and actually work with those ideas and to predict outcomes of 
your uh, con uh, of the behavior that you're contemplating. Um, there's has anybody read the book The Willpower Inst or I'm sorry uh, um, The Happiness Hypothesis? Anybody read that one? Anybody know his name? Oh yeah, I'm blanking on his name. I love his work. Uh, I've read a ton of his work. I'm uh, blanking on his name right now. He described the prefrontal cortex, and my favorite term is that it is a simulator, right? It's just like a flight simulator. It allows you to consider what different paths would be, what divergent paths. If you take this choice, it's likely to go down this road, and this is likely to happen, and that's likely to happen. Um, if you take this path, something different. If you take this path, something different. So as an example, by show of hands, I'm offering a kind of fun exercise uh, after this today. Uh, me and some of my friends are going to go out on the I-35 and dodge cars. Does anybody want to come along? This guy wants to come along. You need more sleep. Okay, so... The reason you all know that that's a bad idea isn't because you've gone out and dodged cars on the I-35 before, right? It's because you've used your memory, your emotional memory, your declarative memory, and your working memory, and your estimation of, you know, very basic physics <laughs> that this is probably not a great idea, and maybe even uh, a little bit of medical knowledge was tied into that. So, um, if you think of this as um, a simulator that's going to allow you to make a decision even on something that you've never actually done in your life, I think it gives you a very accurate idea of what uh, prefrontal cortex is and what executive functioning is, right? If you're running a business and you're faced with a decision, you may have had similar experiences but there's a good chance you've never had that exact experience before, but you're using knowledge, experience, emotion, uh, all sorts of things to make this decision. And these are cognitive experiences. And the reason that I talk about overriding our innate uh, decision-making, we have like this lizard brain that responds to things before our brain, our cognitive decisions get involved, which is why uh, willpower is not the thing to rely on. So let's talk about what willpower is not. Willpower is not an all or nothing phenomenon. Who here is guilty of saying, I have no willpower? I've said this plenty of time, right? Like, I have no willpower. I have five more Cinnabons, let's go. Um, so people often say this, and, and it's absolutely not true. There's no possible way that you are successful enough and educated enough uh, to be in this room and not have willpower. But a lot of us think that about us because we have this idea that willpower, if we have willpower, we will actually do the right thing every time. When nothing could be further from the truth because we're only using it as a simulator. We're only using it to predict the likely outcome. We really don't have any idea what that outcome is. But before we even get to that prediction, we have predisposing beliefs and emotions that are driving us towards one preferred path. So it's not an all or nothing phenomenon. You can have a little bit of willpower here and there. And like I exercised good decision making here and this point I didn't. And there's various reasons why that would happen. And you might guess that being sleep deprived um, is one of the things I'll talk about in interfering with that. It's not a genetic gift. Right? This is the other thing I hear all the time. It's like, well, I'm just not wired like that. I just can't, I just can't use my willpower. I have no willpower, and I've never had any willpower, or none of buddy in my family's ever had any willpower. Um, and that is obvi obviously it's not true. There's no possibility, again, that that's true. But we like to think of it as like, you know, it's like being strong, or it's like being tall, or it's like something that you're good at. It's like being smart, and it's not. It's something that you can train, and it's something that should be trained, and we'll talk about why to, why to train it, how to use it, um, and again, not to rely on it to change behavior, but to use it as a simulator. Um, how, uh, <laughs> willpower is not self-flagellation, okay? This is the most common thing that I am, I am gonna hate myself so much that I'm gonna go to the gym every single day. And when I don't feel like going to the gym, I'm gonna look in front of the mirror and go, what a fat piece of shit I am. I'm going to the gym, right? 
this is the worst thing you can do for willpower, right? Because now you are stressing out your prefrontal cortex. And when your prefrontal cortex is really stressed out, does anyone know what we call that? Fight or flight, okay? Fight or flight is maximum stress up here. And what happens when maximum stress goes up here is your body, is your brain says, oh, let's turn this off because we need to use impulsive behavior to get out of this really bad situation. So now you've completely gotten rid of any possibility you had at willpower because you're beating yourself down. And we see evidence um, of this continued self-flagellation leading to pathological or dysfunctional expressions of the exact desire that you're trying to suppress. And not to be, uh, um, you know, not to, not to be, sl uh, you know, snide or flippant about it, but you know the um, the things you hear about, say, like with uh, chastity vows amongst uh, priests and dysfunctional expression of a lifelong suppression of a normal physiological drive, like sex. This same thing can happen with eating. If you constantly are beating yourself down over eating, you're much more likely to be a binge eater. Um, you're much more likely to get depressed and not exercise at all if you feel like you're not meeting your ideal goal. Um, willpower is also not the key to changing behavior, which is what we're about to talk about. That's really the whole message. If you get nothing out of this, remember that sentence. Um, even if you don't believe it, just remember it and keep repeating it and eventually you'll believe it. Not serious there. Um, let me make sure I covered everything I wanted to there. Um, no, we're good. So, um, really briefly, I'm not trying to make neuroanatomists out of any of you because I'm not a neuroanatomist either. Uh, I actually have to study this, time, this stuff every time I uh, present it again. But basically what, what I'm talking about with overriding your innate desires um, people have heard this area down here called the lizard brain, right? So this, par this part of your brain is essentially, like is anybody here um, right now thinking about how many times they want their heart to beat per minute? Or how many times they want to breathe per minute? Maybe that if you're trying to relax, but uh, like how, how much blood glucose do I want right now? I'm gonna dial that in. Yeah, like you, you're not in control of that, right? These are what we call autonomic behaviors. Um, and these are driven by, you know, these are driven by lots of complex circuitous pathways. But this is the lizard brain. This is the brain that reptiles have that er like every species on the planet has. And it essentially makes them do things automatically, just like it makes us do things automatically. But what separates us apart from all these other animals that do things automatically without thinking about it is they don't have a simulator. They don't have the simulator up front, right? The day you see a squirrel stockpiling nuts for retirement, we'll say, okay, maybe there's another prefrontal cortex out there. But until then, I mean, you just, you can't say that, that any other animal has this capacity. Um, Another great example of, will, uh, of innate behavior is, you know, we're in, we're in agreements, uh, agreement here about uh, ancestral development and evolutionary health and all those types of things. Um, 10,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, when we came across food, there weren't any refrigerators, right? So we would eat everything that we could possibly eat. Right? So we eat everything we can possibly eat because we don't know when the next meal's coming. It might not ever come. So we've, we've got to eat. We've got to shovel it all in there. That's an innate behavior. We can use the simulator to say, if I do that, I'm not going to fit into my butt jeans the, you know, next Friday when I go out on a date or you know, my bikini. I'm going to look doughy in my bikini or whatever. So I can use the simulator to say, nope, we're not going to eat everything in sight, all right? So that's the whole idea of overriding that behavior. Very quickly, you've probably heard this ad nauseum. Um, I just wanted to talk about it uh, super quickly because we'll talk about how this gets disrupt disrupted. You know, but the blue light is driving melatonin production through some ganglion in our eyes. This isn't super important stuff. And then we're producing melatonin. Melatonin is working through this little thing here, the SCN, and it's it, these... The, down in here, there's what we call wake-promoting uh, neurotransmitters, things like histamine and epinephrine and glutamate and other things are being uh, produced down here to make us more awake. Um, and that all gets shut down with uh, melatonin and GABA as well. 
and we decrease our alerting and we go to sleep and then when we're asleep we get all this memory consolidation and great things happen in our brains and we emotionally categorize and all this and it makes us better at using our simulator the next day because now it's all organized up here as opposed to just being random inputs. Um, so how does sleep increase willpower if you, if you buy that or even if you don't buy that? Um, you know, sleep increases willpower in several ways. Uh, obviously, the, you know, since I'm saying that it's primarily your prefrontal cortex that's giving you the ability to simulate and decide if you want to do what your innate brain is telling you to do, and we know that the brain is restored during sleep and all of its energy sources and all of this is being uh, replenished during sleep, and if you running around stressed, when you're sleep deprived, you're always stressed. You have excessive adrenal hormones, which is feeding back into emotional centers, which is making you more anxious, which is making your prefrontal cortex work less, which is why at the end of the day, you have less willpower than you have in the beginning of the day. You get willpower fatigue as you make more and more decisions during the day. If you use your willpower more and more, you get worse and worse at exerting your willpower, which is why you shouldn't have a pint of ice cream in your refrigerator if you're trying to stay paleo and you come home from work and you're like, I could cook this steak and steam this broccoli or I could start paleo tomorrow and, <laughs> right? Um, the prefrontal cortex is refueled during sleep, as I just said. Sleep deprivation, in, you know, leads to all this stuff. Decreased insulin sensitivity, you guys have heard this. More stress hormones, which is cortisol and ad adrenaline increased inflammation, more neurotoxins, those get flushed out while you're asleep, um, down regulation of uh, these uh, dopamine receptors down there, which is our pleasure, not pleasure, but it's our wanting, it's our drive, our motivation, it makes us crave things, involved in a lot of drug addiction and stuff, we won't get into that. Decreased endorphins, you don't get your runner high, you're more sensitive to pain, uh, if you're more sensitive to pain, you're more stressed, your brain isn't working as well. Decreased serotonin, People with low serotonin are called depressed. Uh, and there's actually good research over a three year period that short sleeping, sleeping two hours less than you need every night leads to a measurable atrophy of the brain and primarily the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, which are both involved in your willpower. Um, and the prefrontal cortex is nearly useless under anxiety for the fight or flight reasons that we talked about. This is my standard slide, we don't even need to read it, but sleep improves everything. Like, name me anything, I'll tell you, it'll make, sleep will make you better, and if, um, if I can't figure out something, I'll make something up. But, so the next question, and obviously begs the question, how much sleep do I really need? This data has been out for over 50 years. It's been recently updated, changed by about 2%. <laughs> so this, this is valid. No matter who you are, what your middle name is, where you grew up, this is how much sleep you need according to age. There are a very few amount of outliers that need significantly more or significantly less. So if you drink in the Kool-Aid and you're digging it, how are you going to get good sleep? You've probably heard all of this stuff from me before. Um, you know, this is, all, uh, this is all sleep hygiene stuff, you know, get rid of the electronics, black in room, all this. I want to really focus on this. Learn ways to decrease stress. By decreasing stress, decreasing sympathetic tone, decreasing weight promoting neurons while you're trying to sleep, decreasing or increasing insulin sensitivity, which means more glucose in the brain, more fuel to the brain. Um, relaxation can do all of this. And I don't care if that's diaphragmatic breathing or Mark Devine's, um, what is he, he calls it four by four breathing. Uh, Eric Carteret calls it box breathing. Uh, medi you know, just simple meditation. Anything that's a meditative state, anything that causes you to pay attention to the now on purpose and be aware of what you're doing and what you're thinking. That will allow you to make a conscious decision as to whether or not that emotion that you're feeling that's making you want to consider doing something is actually the right emotion. Where is that actually coming from? You have to observe yourself. And that comes from the mindfulness aspect, spirituality. Just being relaxed allows you to observe yourself and say, do I really want a Cinnabon? Or am I stressed and worried about something? And I think that you know, eating some sugar is gonna reduce my cortisol in my brain and I'm gonna feel better. 
It's the latter. It's always the latter. Nobody really wants to eat a Cinnabon. I mean, you can get a cavity from smelling those things, right? Um, exercise, insulin sensitivity, all stuff you've heard, decreased blue light, this magic cocktail I just talked about, nothing in there except the substrates that produce, you know, that are involved in producing melatonin uh, and engaging normal sleep. Um, and then, of course, always worry about sleep apnea. If you're a super bad snore, you probably don't know it, but your spouse probably does. And so trust them. What can you do, now that I work with corporate clients, this is a big problem. What can you do if you just cannot sleep enough? You're on shift work, you're a law enforcement officer, you're a special forces guy, and you just don't have any control. A few things we can do to mitigate. Napping, oftentimes it gets a bad name. Napping is excellent. Napping does all sorts of great things. I would love to do a one hour lecture just on the benefits of napping. The research is phenomenal. Um, I actually will present some of that tomorrow during the sleep and adolescence lecture, uh, the kids sleep. Um, a few nuances, a nap is defined 20 minutes to 120 minutes. Over 120 minutes, we call it sleep. Uh, warm body temperature, this is the opposite of nighttime sleeping, assuming that's where you do the majority of your sleep. Nocturnal sleep, your body temperature goes down. What cues a nap in the afternoon is a body temperature going up. Nap in a warm environment. There's a great book called Take a Nap where you can actually read, calculate when you woke up, when's the best time for you to take a nap depending on what you want. Do you want more creativity? Do you want more executive functioning? Do you want more physical performance? Take a nap here, make it this long. Fabulous book out of UCSD, my alma mater, has nothing to do with me, but um, really like the book. You guys know nutrition. We've talked about relaxation training. Uh, more sleep mitigation. Um, I won't talk too much about melatonin. You've all heard about this. It's commonly overdosed. This, has to be, this really should be done with, with the guidance of somebody really skilled at this. You need very, very small doses, but you can shift with travel and so forth. You can shift your circadian rhythm to match your sleep cycles and to get better sleep and to replenish your neurotransmitters and to have a better prefrontal cortex more quickly if you use melatonin, uh, small doses. Again, not to be a smarmy used car salesman, but my, like my product, that's why my product has three micrograms of melatonin in there. Like one gram of melatonin is a huge swack. Um, uh, bright lights, of course, can wake you up uh, in the morning, right? It can help you wake up. It can, and if you're really tired where you're going, it can help you stay awake towards the end of the night. You can do bright light therapy. I wouldn't recommend anything this bright. Um, stimulant use, basically I'm talking about caffeine. Nicotine is fine in a gum form or a mint form, but obviously smoking has some detrimental, deleterious effects. Um, Music is a great way to relax, and uh, that's not Pearl Jam, but you know something like Beethoven or you know spa type music. Um, but you can use it the other way to stimulate yourself awake. You can play like really loud Pearl Jam and all that type of stuff. Um, again, relaxation. I could go on forever, but this is a great measure right here. If you guys have heard of heart rate variability training, good on you. If you haven't get out more, listen to, uh, it's a very common thing. You can buy iPhone apps now or you just put something on your ear, you can figure out how much your heart rate's varying. When it varies a lot, your autonomics are balanced. When it doesn't vary much, you're more sympathetic, which means you're more stressed, which means this boy isn't working and you're making bad decisions. Um, improving willpower, we already talked about, you know, just sleep, 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 sleep. Not that I have any interest in sleep, uh, you're napping, the other mitigation techniques, and then you know just these habit changing techniques. Uh, one thing that I, I wanted to talk about that I really didn't get into, um, when we talk about you know, mindfulness, we talked about when you wanna change a behavior, it makes a lot more sense to replace a behavior as opposed to just saying, I'm not doing that anymore, and now you have a void. Put something in place of that, you'll be more successful at changing your habit. There's something called effort discounting and new set points. So really, the key to changing behavior instead of using willpower is you find a new set point. It's like a thermostat. If I want it to be 65 degrees in my house, my air conditioner is gonna come on every time it goes above 65. 
If I want, if I set my thermostat to my heat at 72 and my air conditioning at 65, they're just going to battle all the time. You have to find the set point that's right for you, whether that's how much work you're going to do every day, how lean you want to be, how much you're going to eat, what type of diet you're going to maintain, all those things. You have to make the decision that this is my set point, this is what's acceptable for me. And then you remove all of the possibilities for avoiding that, like the pint of ice cream example, okay? That's what's called effort discounting. So you make it easier to eat well. You get out of bed and nothing is available in your room except your workout clothes. And you can put on your workout clothes and not go to the gym, but you'll probably feel like an idiot. So you'll be like, well, I'll go to the gym at least for a few minutes. And I have clients who say, I don't have time, I don't have time. And I say, all right. How about 10 minutes? Like, no. Five minutes? No. I'm like, all right, well, put on your workout clothes and go stand outside for one minute and then go back in. And they say, okay, I'm going to do that. And then, of course, they'll go on a walk. You know, they'll do some exercise. And then the other thing, very, very important, and you guys are all doing it. You're here. Community. Community changes your belief systems. That innate desire, we have to change the belief system. Changing the set point is changing the belief system. What does it mean to eat the wrong foods that you don't want to do? What does it mean to have too much body fat? What does it mean to be stressed at work? Like you have to, you have to take whatever stimulus is coming at you and attribute a new meaning to it. And the best way is to hang around with the people who have the belief system you want. That will become your belief system, and then it won't be acceptable for you to do other things. And now you have community support, and this is why Alcoholics Anonymous and so forth work. Um, that is the end of my presentation, and I believe I have about seven or eight minutes for questions at this point. Oh, 15. Phew. We got it all day. Hi. Hi. Uh, I come from Brazil, and I don't know if you guys are having this problem here in the U.S., but people are prescri prescribing melatonin for keeping young. And they prescribe really high doses uh, per day. Uh, what's the, you know, what's the danger of uh, of it of of prescribing, let's say, three grams melatonin a day? Three, uh, three grams. Yes, uh, per, uh, three to five grams. I think uh, this is. You eat that with a spoon or a snort? That's a lot. Of, I, mean, I think it's crazy. Yeah. That, I think you're right. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, so the down, I mean, the downside of that, that what, okay, so the rationale behind that is that uh, much of what we experience externally, when you look at me and you think the guy looks about 25, um, you're saying that because I have this nice fluffy skin and it's all smooth and sharp jawline. No, no. So uh, oxidation damages our skin, right? Oxidation gives us the pigment changes. Oxidation damages collagen, so we kind of get saggy. Melatonin is a great antioxidant. The concept is that this is probably applying its, you know, this is probably occurring across multiple organ systems and not just on the skin, and so therefore it's an anti-aging product. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of validity to that. If you look at the uh, research on it, it is a great antioxidant, uh, but it gets in the way of a lot of other things. If, um, the biggest danger with that is that if I gave you three grams of melatonin every day, for one thing, I would expect you know, the first month for you to barely be able to stay awake because I am completely crushing your adrenal function. Um, but the other thing is that you'll quit responding to melatonin in this pathway that we're talking about that induces sleep. And the other thing that will happen is that you will quit making your own melatonin. So whenever you quit taking it, it's just like any other hormone. If uh, like, um, you take a bodybuilder, for example, who takes 10 times the amount of testosterone that his body would ordinarily produce, he does this for a year, he quits taking it, he doesn't produce any more testosterone. And the reason he's having to take 10 times as much is because his body has quit responding to twice as much, and then five times as much, and then eight times as much, and so now he's up to 10 times as much. The same thing would happen with melatonin. You would chase that on infinitum. I don't know what the toxicity, like where toxicity exists with melatonin, but I assume at some point it would be toxic. Is Dan Party in here? Toxicity in melatonin? Brilliant neuroscientist here, knows more than I do about this stuff. Hit it. 
Uh, wow us. <laughs> So I don't know a ton about melatonin, um, but it has been researched for uh, at pretty high doses for neurological disorders. Uh -huh. um, one guy, Alan Louie up in Portland, uh, University Health Science Center up there, he's been doing research on it for 30 years, and he feels that we have a melatonin deficiency syndrome and that everybody over a certain age should be taking some amount of it. But not, uh, th not three grams, I would assume. No, but I think that, and I, 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 when you ask that question, over there, I was trying to remember, because I saw him speak at Stanford, he mentioned some Stanford. study that was looking at, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he came down and spoke to the sleep department, and he was mentioning a study where they were using really, really high doses, but it was for really intense neurological disorder. So treating disease treating. as opposed to... Yeah, advanced But Parkinson's. as far as you know, like, there's no level that's toxic where, that, that you've heard of? No. Okay. Yeah, it's... Um, most things have some level of toxicity, but uh, the body deals with it, even high levels, pretty well. Cool. All right. Hopefully that answers your question, because that's all I have. Hi, Dr. Parsley. I, if I don't set an alarm, I will regularly sleep 12 to 14 hours at a time, uninterrupted. Sure. I'd like your general opinion on that. It might be noteworthy to say I have two autoimmune diseases, mm -hmm. and is it possible to get better and change that? I don't actually like it. Yeah, I mean, there, there, is, there is good, uh, there is research that supports the idea that you know, sleeping an excessive amount um, is you know, just as deleterious as sleeping an insufficient amount. Um, of course, you, I mean, you have to control for what, what's causing you to sleep that much, and in your case, um, we already know what's causing that, right? So if you have, um, you know, my suspicion is that you're probably not getting super deep quality sleep. If you have autoimmune disease, then you have hyperinflammation, and hyperinflammation leads to hyperadrenalism, which leads to hypercortical uh, level, or hypercortisone levels, and all, you know, all of these types of things that we're talking about. Um, as far as your immunity and your neuroregeneration and fuel, you know, fuel partitioning even for the brain is, is uh, somewhat controlled by how much cortisol is in there um, and how much inflammation is going on, how many inflammatory products are in your brain. It could be that it's taking you, because of your inflammatory cascades, that it's taking you that much longer to flush all of that out. It's taking you that much longer for your body to actually feel restored. Um, but it could also be that these inflammatory cascades are just essentially shutting down um, your, in, your endogenous production of the weight-promoting hormones that ordinarily are coming from your brain stem to wake you up. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're kind of in, you're in deep waters there as far as the specifics of what your uh, autoimmunity is. Um, but, you know, my stab at that, if, uh, if you came to me as a client, I would say, well, let's do everything we can to get your inflammation down as low as we can possibly get it. Um, autoimmune disease, by definition, is hyperinflammatory. Um, get rid of all the inflammation that we possibly can and then see how you sleep. Um, and of course, there's ways to do that with uh, nutritionally through anti-inflammatory diet and then things like omega-3s help. Um, you know, they probably just, you know, probably would warrant, um, you know, even trying some sort of pharmaceutical, something like Mobic, like a gentle anti-inflammatory um, and tho like those types of things. Um, and, you know, there, there's some, uh, I, I don't know that I've read research on it, but I, you know, I've seen some, you know, publications on, you know, certain types of massage, you know, certain type of massages, you know, helping to get inflammatory products out of your interstitium, you know, like your lymphatic systems and clearing that, and perhaps that makes things better for you. Uh, but I'd like to talk to you more about that afterwards. That, but that's kind of a high level, high level question, and I don't, I don't want. We, we don't need to all see, you know, talk about your, <laughs> uh, your personal life to that extent, but you know, that's the general gist of what my approach would be to it. Hi, I've got two questions based on your interpretation. Now you can only have one. <laughs> well, I'll, t I'll say them very quickly in succession. Tie so them together, put a, put a comma in there. <laughs> okay. Um, so there are a lot of apps that you can stick in your bed that uh, 
measure how much you move while you sleep. Right. I want to know if those are backed by science. Does how much I move really correlate with how deep of sleep I'm in? So it depends on what you consider science. Um, <laughs> nebulous term, uh, and I mean, it's tongue in cheek, but it's, it's sort of like, you know, do you have to have RCTs before it's science? Um, it, it does, it is true uh, that you are paralyzed during REM sleep. So if you're not moving a lot, you're probably in REM sleep in the lighter half of the night. If you're not, lo if you're not moving a lot in the beginning of the night, um, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that you're in super deep sleep. You could actually not be asleep at all, and you could just be laying there calmly, you know, trying to fall asleep. Um, but some of the devices we worked with with the SEAL teams, uh, the Zio, which they don't make anymore, we found some pretty tight correlations when we did uh, when we did sleep studies on people and we produced a hypnogram and we actually saw like a what does this guy's sleep architecture look like and then we compared it to a month of his data. Um, it correlates pretty well. Uh, you, you'd have to really understand the differences of the cycle really though to say that this was actually deep sleep in the sense of theta and delta brain waves and growth hormone and testosterone secretion of those things versus deep sleep meaning not moving which is REM. Uh, which yeah. could very well be REM, I should say. Yeah. Um, so some, some correlation. Uh, yeah. Better than nothing, the be the, I think the best use of this, and this is really something you should talk to Dan about because he has a really cool program on, on how to use this and how to use it to you know, use metrics to increase your performance and so forth. Um, but I forgot what else I was going to yeah. say. So well, next I've seen question. it correlate pretty well with how much caffeine, because I'm very sensitive to it, that mm -hmm. I have during the day. I'll be way higher, and I'll move a lot more, and I'll get less sleep. So generally speaking, it seems to work. Yeah, yeah and so, oh, the other thing I was going to say is as long as you're comparing yourself to you, then, yeah. you know, you know then, then the, uh, you know, the, the subjectivity is somewhat removed if it's consistent every night. So, well, this this seems really common every night that I'm in this much deep sleep and this much light sleep and then I you know, drink too much alcohol and now I have this big gap where I'm in really light sleep instead of being in any deep sleep then yeah. you, know, you could use it in that respect. Um, I think sort of total time in bed and total time resting regardless of what sleep you're in is probably the best metric for using that thing. It's like uh, you know, then you know, am I, you know, did I toss and turn and move around a lot for two hours or did I do that the same as every other night, like 15 minutes and I got, you know, seven hours and 45 minutes of sleep or did I get six hours of sleep? Yeah. Um, so that, that's what I think it's most useful for. Okay. The other question is you had a note about naps not affecting your nocturnal sleep. As long as you stay within those parameters of 20 minutes and 120 minutes. Um, and your nap is at least three hours before your normal bedtime, preferably further back. But hello, hello, down in on the right. Or, okay. Hi there. Um, I'm from Washington State, where oh. we have uh, legal cannabis products available for medicinal recreational. I'm someone who's been using low, t low to no THC, high CBD products for sleep and nerve pain. I'm just wondering, do you have anything in your work relating to CBDs for sleep and um, I've, issues? As you can imagine, the military is not in favor of such things, so right. um, I don't have a lot of seal data on that. Um, I do have a few, pri a few private clients who use it. Um, I've, I've actually seen conflicting research on that. Um, almost, almost any uh, non-physiologic substance that you use in your body to aid your sleep is going to affect sleep architecture to some degree, right? Um, some sleep age really mess up deep sleep, like, you know, stages three and four, or as we used to call them, uh, the slow wave sleep cycles. Some really affect REM, some affect both. Um, I've seen conflicting evidence on the cannabis because, w you know, what cannabis means is a huge spectrum, right? Um, and, it, you know, as you're, as you're talking about, like, you know, things that are specifically designed for certain receptors versus just a swath of backyard grown pot that, you know, you know, surfers are using or whatever. 
and not the surfers are bad people. I'm not saying that. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer for you on that, but um, it, you know, if you have a lot of pain issues and, it's, and you feel like it's making you sleep better and you're you know, metabolically and cognitively intact, and especially with, with the absence of THC, I would say there's very little downside, and I would probably do that over a pharmaceutical like Ambien or something like that. Game's over, but it, we're going to take this guy's question anyways, because oh, I'm, right. I'm a rebel. I'm to your left, back by the stairs. Okay. I can't see anybody, but I'm pretending that's, like I can. <laughs> that's okay. Um, we work in an ob -gen office with a I'm lot sorry. of menopausal women. And, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry um, about that. Yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're doing everything we can with bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, with nutritional replacements. I mean, everything that we can to help these women sleep. We're working on their environments. That, you know their sleep habitat and all that kind of stuff um, but in your experience what have you found is still the missing link we're gonna we tried your sleep cocktail last night ourselves and so we're gonna be trying that too and and so what else have you oh she really liked it okay, okay. Yeah, that was, that's what I wanted to know thanks for the plug <laughs> you're welcome it was fantastic right fantastic um, and and so um, but yeah what have you found that's been still the missing link are they not meditating are they not relaxing what is it? We're talking about crazy menopausal women. Precisely. Um, I I don't think that I don't think that I see uh, a trend, and I I actually don't treat a lot of females anymore. Uh, a few years back, I had a fair number of clients. Um, mainly, they were seals' wives and so forth. Uh, menop menopause, like female hormones, are so ridiculously complex. Uh, you women are complex in every way, and hormones are no exception. Um, you know, men is like testosterone, good. You know, women is like, well, you got to balance this one, and that's got to go up, and this has got to go down. Um, so, th th you know, that's a very difficult pathway. My experience with women in general, whether they're menopausal, perimenopausal, or new mothers, um, I think it's a cultural development thing, a societal development thing, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be sexist or anything like this, but I think women, by and large, are, you know, taught to be more communicative and more. Uh, you know, more, uh, more of the problem solvers, sort of uh, pleasing type uh, folks that internalize a lot of negative outcomes on themselves, and so they tend to ruminate more over their decisions. Whereas, you know, a lot of guys are just kind of pricks, and they're like, yeah, if that, it's his fault. Like, I did everything I was supposed to do. And women are like, well, if I would have said this slightly different, maybe that would happen. And, you know, and I probably shouldn't have said that. And, or, you know, I might have hurt his feelings. And so, um, my biggest, like, what, what I've had the most success with, with women, I'd say 90% of the women I treat have initiation insomnia. They can't fall asleep. Their mind's going a million miles an hour. And that's a lot of behavioral stuff. And, it, um, and it's a lot of, you know, making your list of to-do list and your to-worry list, the things I've talked about before. You have to make a list of everything you want to worry about because you don't want to forget to worry about the things you have no control over. Um, so you're gonna, you know, make sure your list is there, and then, uh, and then I tell them, all right, now you put your clock away, you put your, you know, you, uh, you put your alarm clock in your drawer. It's going to go off. You know it's going to go off, and you're not going to get out of bed until that happens. And if you wake up, uh, if you can't go to sleep, you just lay there and relax. Um, and if you still can't go to sleep, you just lay there and you breathe and you meditate and you do progressive muscle relaxation or active muscle relaxation or whatever it is that kind of gets you out of your head. And if just like meditation, if those ideas come into your head, you just push them back out and you say, well, I have, I'm going to do all of that when my alarm goes off. I have my list written, so I'm going to handle all that then. Um, so getting rid of the initiation insomnia is the big thing. If it's hormonal, I t if, it's, if it's hormonally driven, I usually maintenance insomnia. They're usually waking up in the middle of the night. And at that point, I find it, it's probably best to kind of dial in either nutrition, uh, insulin sensitivity issues can cause that, um, deficiencies in progesterone can cause that, even deficiencies in estrogen because it can call a, cause a luteal surge that then makes them hot and kind of simulates their body and makes them wake up. Um, I, I, that seemed like a word salad to me, but it, hopefully that answered your question. I don't know. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think uh, they're going to make me get off stage, but I'm going to be right back on this stage, so stick around. All right.